Welcome to uh, the State of the Science Single Family Water Recycling Applications webinar. My name is Paula Kehoe and I'm the Director of Water Resources with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And I'm just gonna wait uh, a, a minute or so to have allow all the participants to join. So uh, folks could just wait a minute or so. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so again, uh, welcome to the State of the Science Single Family Water Recycling Applications webinar. My name is Paula Kehoe. I'm the Director of Water Resources with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Um, today's webinar, uh, I'm going to provide a, a brief background and overview, and then we're going to hear from our three panelists, Michael Jane and Jay Garland with US EPA, Brian Pexson and Anya Kaufman with Trussell Technologies, Ava Renehart and Eberhard Morganroth with AAVAD. And then I'm gonna conclude with uh, a few comments on next steps. Uh, we are asking that all of you use the Q&A for questions for the panelists, and we will address those questions following all of the presentations. So just to jump into the topic, when we think about it, uh, buildings are actually sources of water. They produce many different types of water, including rainwater, stormwater, foundation drainage, gray water, black water, and condensate. And by collecting and treating these water, so treating these water sources on site, we can then reuse these water uh, sources for non-potable applications such as toilet flushing and irrigation. And in San Francisco, we asked ourselves, what more can we do to reuse water within buildings to reduce the use of potable water for non-potable applications? We recognized that we needed to address the biggest barriers facing the deployment of on-site water treatment systems, and that it, those barriers include water quality standards, as well as the lack of, of guidance and oversight and management for ongoing protection of public health. And in San Francisco, we tackled these issues head on. First, when it came to building our headquarters, we decided to install an on-site water treatment system in which we incorporated an engineered wetland treatment system to treat all of the wastewater and black water we produce in the building to reuse that water for toilet flushing and irrigation. We were able to reduce our potable water consumption by 50%. Second, we realigned our governmental policies in 2012 by creating an ordinance to allow more buildings to collect and treat water on site. This ordinance established water quality standards, a permitting structure, as well as ongoing reporting to protect uh, public health. Third, we established a clear and streamlined process to enable developers to move quickly through the process to install an on-site water treatment system. Our transformative model shifts the key responsibilities from the public sector to the private sector. And in this model, private actors plan, implement, operate, and maintain on-site water treatment systems, which are permitted and sanctioned by the city. Our program has evolved over time. In 2012, as I mentioned, with ordinance went into place for a single building. In 2013, we amended the ordinance to allow for district scale applications where two or more buildings could take, take water from one treatment system. In 2015, uh, we became a mandatory requirement for new buildings over 250,000 square feet to treat water for toilet flushing and irrigation. In 2021, we lowered that threshold to 100,000 square feet. We've also been working with partners in, uh, across, the, across North America. Uh, in 2012, we established the National Blue Ribbon Commission for On-Site Non-Potable Water Systems. And this is a very unique partnership with public health regulators, water and wastewater utilities, US EPA, who you will hear from later today, as well as the US Army. 
Um, our partnership is really about establishing appropriate water quality standards and to promote consistency among states to protect public health. We of course encourage oversight management programs and develop a number of technical and policy documents and serve as a forum for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Several of our documents um, are posted here, but they're also available on our website. And I have the link to that uh, at the end of my presentation. We are uh, continuing to do uh, a number of uh, projects at the National Blue Ribbon Commission, including developing a national certificate program to uh, increase the number of skilled operators for on-site water treatment systems, as well as addressing uh, conflicting plumbing codes by working with industry to amend plumbing codes uh, to align with the work that we're doing at the National Blue Ribbon Commission. And finally, expanding our partnership uh, beyond North America. And today, um, what we wanna talk about is uh, single family water reuse applications. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is very interested in assessing these new applications such as recirculating shower heads, recirculating clothes washers, as well as single family gray water treatment systems. We wanna understand the state of the science to protect public health with single family water reuse applications. And today we're here to, to learn about uh, what is going on in the state of the science. And finally, we wanna assess the feasibility and implementation of single family water recycling applications in San Francisco. And so I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Jay Garland and to Michael Jane. And while they're doing that, I'm going to provide an introduction. So thank you. Let's see, you can share your screens. Perfect. You guys see our slides? Yes. Great. Sorry, I'm trying to find my note. Okay. Hold on. Okay, so we have Michael Jane and um, Jay Garland, both from the EPA, Office of Research and Development. And um, sorry. Um, Jay. Uh, Jay Garland uh, has a PhD in environmental science from the University of Virginia and spent over 20 years working for NASA's effort to develop closed loop, closed bioregenerative life support systems for extended human spaceflight. Uh, NASA recognized him for innovative technical achievements four separate times. And he's worked on a, a wide range of topics, including methods for microbial community analysis, factors affecting survival of human associated pathogens and various biological approaches for recycling waste. His current efforts focus on advancing innovative approaches to water infrastructure, including decentralized water reuse and mitigating risks associated with antimicrobial resistance in the water cycle. And Jay is with Michael Jane, uh, who's also with the US EPA Office of Research and Development, where he specializes in quantitative microbial assessment and fit for purpose water reuse. His current research inter in interests include decentralized water reuse applications, antimicrobial resistance in the built and natural environments, public health monitoring in community wastewaters, and hazard characterizations of alternative water sources. He holds both an MS as well as a PhD in environmental science and engineering from Clarkson's University in New York. Thank you and welcome Jay and Michael. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm going to start. I'm Jay. I'm the old guy. Mike is the young guy. He'll go next. Um, so what I want to do real briefly is kind of give an overview and a little background on the risk-based approach, because we're going to talk, Mike's going to talk about that as well as the other speakers and really kind of give you kind of some basics on, on quantitative microbial risk assessment. There we go. So uh, Paula showed this slide, you're right, and, and emphasized the idea of, of buildings as kind of flipping the problem as a, as a source of water, not a source of waste. Uh, and I think, but from the point of view of this talk, you need to think about these different uh, water sources and what the risks are associated with those and how QMRA really allows you to kind of drill in and understand each one of those separate wastewaters and uh, how well you have to treat it for safe reuse. Um, and when you do that, so in this slide, you talk about you know, a, a variety of different source waters, treatment, 
for, to remove pathogens. And all the talk today is going to be, since we're talking about non-potable reuse, we're talking about pathogen risk, not chemical risk, uh, because that's the acute risk of concern, not chronic ingestion for, say, uh, from some chemicals and, and cancer risks. For this, it's focused on, on pathogen risk. And then looking at it for different alternative uses, in this case, flushing toilets, clothes washing, there are other alternative non-potable uses you could, you could envision. And that kind of fits this fit for purpose treatment approach where you're trying to produce, uh, take different alternative source, wa uh, source waters and treat it for different end uses. And particularly this issue of scaling is important for the discussion today because uh, we're really trying to, as you think about these waste waters, particularly shower waters like gray water or black water, the level of pathogens in that water is going to depend on the scale of collection. The amount that's coming in a, in a single family house is going to be different than a larger building, and certainly bigger than a centralized wastewater collection facility. Now, uh, Paula mentioned kind of the, the, the history here of the Blue Ribbon Commission and what San Francisco uh, PUC has led over the last, say, decade. And really, where we're, the starting point and the problem was that there was guidance for, say, gray water reuse for the flush toilets, but there was highly variable levels and it varied by state by state, not for any good reason, right? Not because the risk would vary by state or they should have different standards, but just because there was, there was not a, a, a consistency in the development of the guidance. Now, the National Sanitation Foundation, NSF 350, really moved in the, in, in the right direction to standardize what the treatment requirements would be. But this approach, I mean, and you notice that the treatment requirement for pathogen or uh, biological quality is, is, is E. coli. And uh, this, is a, this, this, this approach should be really recognized as an advancement because it's tried to standardize uh, uh, consistent standards for rigorous treatment, but it's not risk-based. And what we mean by that is that it's based on these fecal indicators, the E. coli, not the actual risks that we're most concerned with are most likely viral and protozoan risks related to reuse and exposure to the, these waters. Uh, and so this risk-based approach really shifts it to thinking about infection uh, and the disease that's causing, not the indicator levels. So in this case, you, you'd have a health benchmark that you're trying to treat the water to, could be, and these represent different levels of that health benchmark, could be 10 to the minus fourth infections per person per year, 10 to the minus second, these are different levels that are used for drinking water, some for recreational water. And then there's also, instead of just looking at infection, you can look at the uh, severity of the disease as well, factor in not just the infection, but the, the, the uh, intensity of, of the disease, so to speak. So that's disability adjusted life years. We're not gonna get too much in that discussion today, but that is something that we are uh, continuing to work on. And, and really the World Health Organization and globally, they really shift and use Dallies in, in the U.S., we're more focused on, on risk. And I think moving forward, that's another standardization that we need to consider. But in terms of quantitative microbial risk assessment, uh, you're going to hear a lot about that today. And, and this, this graphic on the left-hand side kind of just shows you a really brief overview where you're really saying, okay, if I take these different kinds of waters and I'm going to reuse it for some end use, uh, as we mentioned, say flushing toilets, clothes washing, what's the exposure volume that someone's going to be uh, kind of exposed to? What's the volume of that water they'd be exposed to? What's the density of the pathogens of concern in that water? What do we know about the dose response? And then that would tell you what the predicted risk is. And the treatment then is what is needed to bring that predicted risk down to what would be tolerable risk. And that tolerable risk is kind of what I said, those health benchmarks are. You set the health benchmark and then the difference between what you predict the risk to be and what you can accept, what's acceptable, is what the re treatment is. And it's normally referred to in log reduction terms because microbes are, their abundance is logarithmic in nature. So it's just easier to speak in terms of LRTs. So that, that overall framework then allows you to look at a variety of different source waters for different end uses and really produce this matrix of different treatment requirements uh, for different end use. So it really fits this, this fit for purpose concept. And, you know, so it's a very structured framework and it's, it's transparent uh, in its assumptions in the models. As we go through that, you may not think all these assumptions are very transparent. There's certainly a lot of mathematics involved in this. So it's, it, but it is all transparent and it's very um, 
flexible because you can adapt it to different waters, different source waters with different pathogen levels to different diff end uses with different exposure volumes. <clears throat> and this, this table just briefly shows the, 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 the LRT table from the initial report that Paula referred to earlier, not to get you know, down in the weeds of these, we're gonna talk about new numbers estimated for single family homes. These were for decentralized reuse of these different waters, but at more of a larger building scale. And today we wanna to focus on really reworking these numbers and how are they different for a building scale use. And as Paula mentioned, there's this group across the country in the US and as well as we have our, our, our European colleagues here, it, there's also national efforts here too, but this is being advanced and adopted by a number of uh, cities and, and states in the US and we're really trying to adopt it, build it into um, kind of uh, the building code. So it really can uh, be uh, sustained in the future. So just real briefly, before we turn to all that talk, the, the one thing I want to point out is that, you know, there's several different questions about looking at this reuse in a decentralized way. I mean, you, first, you have to look at what the acceptable level of treatment is. And that's what we're going to focus mainly on today. Our colleagues from, from UWAG and, and Trussell are going to talk a little bit about this. How do you monitor it? How do you really make sure that you can sustain the performance? What's the kind of operational maintenance of these systems? But the third element is really kind of, does this make sense in a broader broader perspective? And what I mean by that is what, what kinds of uh, unintended consequences may occur if you are trying to do this uh, new way of, of, of reusing water? Uh, and, and one way to approach this is that you can classify it as the proximal or near-term risk. And that's really what we're going to concentrate a lot on today is about what is the risk and how do I minimize the risk for the people who are consuming that water, living in that house or that building. But the other thing I think that we increasingly need to worry about and be concerned about in the world that we live in today is not just the local effects, but what are the global impacts of what we decide to do locally? And that's really this, this third element of what are the distal risks? What are these, these, these kind of far field impacts that we may have? If you're going to recycle this water, what is the energy impacts of that? What are the overall life cycle assessments and cost of doing that? And that's, that's something that we worked on quite extensively with these systems here in EPA. This graphic kind of shows some brief, some results. We've looked at a variety of different size buildings. So what you're looking at is a, a, a graph of global warming potential versus the scale of water reused across a range of buildings. And this is from 50 people building to a thousand occupants and buildings, so larger than a single family. But what this, what this graphic shows you is that for different waters, for rainwater, AC condensate, some areas you don't collect very much water and it's, it has a very high footprint because you're, you implement a system and the cost of implementing the system uh, building it and installing it, and you're really not getting that much water back. But as you move out to collecting more water, the uh, return is actually positive because you're avoiding the energy associated with delivering water to that building. And now on the on the right hand side are these gray water and wastewater, which are the what the waste streams we're going to talk about today. And the thing to remember here is that we, at these buildings, you do get to the point in larger scale buildings where you can get to kind of an energy neutrality or net zero global warming potential consideration. But these are for bigger buildings. So as we move into these household units, we certainly need to understand the risk better locally. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And that is clearly important. But we also need to think about the global impacts. And these data suggest that they these systems are going to be uh, fairly energy intensive and may have broader impacts that we need to consider in the overall assessment. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Mike now to talk about uh, the, the, the risk, this kind of uh, proximal risk uh, uh, evaluation. All right. Thanks, Jay. And so, yeah, so now I'll crack the hood a little bit on these actual models that we use to develop the log reduction targets. And this is a really important concept, too. And then I know it's going to be into the weeds for some folks, but it's really important, I think, you know, this test the stage for the subsequent talks. You're going to hear a little bit more on the practical application of this. But all of the all of the other work that you're going to hear about today also relied on these same approaches that I'm going to introduce. And so so bear with me while I get into the into the weeds a little bit. Um, and so um, what is our approach to developing these risk-based targets? You know, really, um, when we're talking about on-site systems, as Jay mentioned, you know, we our central hypothesis is that the the concentrations are going to be of pathogens are going to be scale dependent. Um, this is going to be driven by community infection rates. And so 
if you have you know a small population the likelihood of you having uh, an infection in that small population is very small and so there's going to be intermittent occurrence of pathogens when you have small systems um, whereas if you talk about a large municipal system you know on average you can assume that someone in that population is already is always shedding pathogens um, when you get down to a thousand person system um, it's going to be less frequent and you get down to a five person uh, per system which is what we use to model our our single family homes uh, you're going to have very rare pathogen occurrences um, however when you do have an occurrence in a very small system you only have wastewater from five from four other people diluting uh, your pathogen concentration and so you can occasionally have very high con pathogen concentrations when you do have an active infection within a small system um, whereas in a larger system you'll have dilution from all the other people who aren't sick in the building as well as all the other wastewater inputs that you have into your system be it commercial and industrial inputs inflow infiltration um, or in combined um, combined sewers you can have of course uh, stormwater inputs as well and so um, we expect that there's going to be as population increases you'll have a higher frequency of of pathogen occurrences but lower concentrations and so um, our previous LRTs we the ones that Jay showed earlier those are focused on a thousand person but that really hasn't been but we also developed them for five person scale and we haven't really emphasized that and so I think I want to spend time some time today explaining how those results differ from the larger decentralized systems um, and what considerations might affect their application um, when you're trying to do this practically. And so um, really what it comes down to is this, this question of initial pathogen densities. And obviously, if we had pathogen measurements, we would use those. That's, that is the gold standard um, for all of our, um, all of our assessments. Um, you know, we have certain criteria that we use when we went into this work that we would use to accept studies. Um, you know, and you know, long story short, there really wasn't data available that met these criteria for any of the source waters we're interested in, including on-site gray water and wastewater. Um, and so uh, we had to take a modeling approach. Um, and really, um, I think this modeling approach, you know, has some other advantages, um, even if there were pathogen dense measurements available because of this issue of rare occurrence. And so you could take a thousand measurements and never get a pathogen hit. And so that's really a wasted effort. And so some type of modeling approach really um, becomes essential when you're talking about these very small systems, if you really want to um, characterize pathogens. Um, we also expect to be wide variability. And so you need a lot of samples to characterize that. Um, and there's detection limits. And so uh, you need to concentrate large volumes of water. And that's uh, generally challenging to do just in order to detect the pathogens. So um, we end up taking modeling approaches. And so for, uh, for on-site wastewater and gray water, um, we use this epidemiology-based approach. And so I mentioned earlier that we expect pathogen occurrence to be driven by community infection rates. And so um, it, we're following epidemiology of those infections in order to predict our concentrations. And so there's really uh, two modules to this model, and they're, they're independent. And so we have um, one, the first one you'll see on the top here is estimating the fecal contamination of different water sources. And so and we can say how many grams of feces are in a gray water collection. Um, and that's based on the fecal indicator concentrations in the water relative to raw feces. Um, separately, we can simulate the occurrence of pathogens in that feces. We say we have a certain size population. How often are, is someone in that population going to be shedding, um, it's going to be shedding pathogens. And so um, that's dependent on uh, community infection rates. We put those together and we say, okay, you have a certain number of grams of feces in your um, in your water, you have a certain number of pathogens per gram of feces, and you can use that to estimate pathogen densities in the water. And so you'll see on the slide here is some of the, the inputs are, are highlighted in red, and those are the ones that are scale dependent. And so this is, this, this is why this model is really useful, because we can say, you know, if we don't have measurements for single family homes, we can model them using an approach like this, or any other scale for that matter. And so um, just cracking the hood in that model, this is what it looks like when you simulate pathogen concentrations. On the left-hand side, this shows the occurrence of new infections in a thousand person system. And on the right-hand side, this shows the cumulative infections. And so I'm um, highlighting those blue rows just to, for, so we can track from left to right. These are the same year of a simulation. And you can see um, on that first row, there's a, a pathogen hits in the middle. That's it. Somebody has a new infection. And you'll see that one carries over for a while. And then someone else has an infection. And so that other person is still shedding. And in this case, on the next day, someone else is infected too. And so it went up to three. And then it goes down to two because someone drops off. And so this is the pattern that we see, you know, in terms of pathogen occurrence. And it really is emphasizing that there are times when there are no pathogens and there are times when there are overlapping infections, which could then increase concentrations more. But what I'm showing here is for a thousand person. If you look at a five person model, you're going to see a lot of zeros. And that's why I didn't show on the slide because it's really boring. It's just a bunch of zeros. Um, very rarely will we have a year where we actually have pathogen hits. Um, and that's what I'm, what I'm showing here is, is the, the pathogen occurrence rates at different scales. And so um, each of these, um, these are representing, each one of these represents a year. And so 
um, in the average year at a five person scale on left hand side, you will have zero occurrence of pathogens in your system in our model. Um, and it, it takes, you have to look at the upper percentiles, the, the rarer years in order to get pathogen hits. And for a lot of the pathogens, um, even in those 95th percentile years, which are the ones that we care about for risk modeling, um, we don't have pathogen occurrences or we have very rare pathogen occurrences. Uh, only norovirus, which is the most common uh, pathogen in our model, um, only that, only norovirus had significant occurrence in, in 95th percentile years. All the other ones were still very rare. And what we can see is as you increase scale, you start to get more pathogen occurrence. And so when you get up to a thousand person, which again is kind of our core model, um, norovirus occurs in all the years, which you know is consistent with what we know about the epidemiology of that virus. And we, have, we also see the other pathogens occurring regularly as well. And so um, there's the other piece of the model, of course, that I mentioned earlier is, the con is the, this dilution effect too. And so you have these rare occurrences, but when they do occur, there's limited dilution because there's not many other people in the system contributing wastewater that doesn't have pathogens in it. And so um, you can see on, this, on the left panel, um, for, for most of the pathogens, um, your concentrations at a five person scale, which is the first bar there, are considerably higher than they would be in a thousand person scale. Again, when occurring. Um, I, and so this question is, how does this interplay of rare occurrence and occasional high concentrations impact your annual risk? And I'll put it on the right hand side just for a completion that for norovirus is actually interesting because we do see that overlapping infections and increase and the increase in concentrations when you do get to larger scales. Um, and again, and just going back to back to the basics here, because it is a modeling approach, um, just want to do a reality check on it because there's so many inputs in these models uh, that you know, hear about that later on today, too, that, you know, have uncertainty in them as well. And it's really challenging to validate these models because of the, the limitations of pathogen measurement that I mentioned earlier. And so um, we did um, embark on a, on a limited campaign to validate these models and say, hey, how did they ground check against, um, against real world systems? And so um, this is a data from a, a large system around more of a thousand person scale um, where we actually thought we would get hits of pathogens based on our boundary results. Um, and we did. And so um, what, what this, uh, the lines, uh, the, hor the, the, the bouncy lines there show our measurements using two different PCR measurements. This is a norovirus genome group two. Um, and the horizontal lines show different percentiles of our simulation. And so um, what you can see is that our, our simulation for on-site wastewater really did a, a great job of characterizing both the typical conditions, that, that, that middle solid line um, of, uh, of, uh, of concentrations, as well as some of these um, higher peak concentration events. And so we see, you know, the other, we see the variability that we anticipated based on the model. And so this is really, really exciting results for us. Um, then, of course, the, this is getting to the, the real question is, how does that interplay of pathogen occurrence and pathogen concentrations really affect your log reduction targets, your, your risk-based treatment? And so the top half of this, of this table here shows the LRTs that Jay showed in the earlier slide for um, a thousand person system. And I've boxed some of them just to make it clear for what we're talking about here. Um, and the bottom side shows um, the, what those same LRTs would be for a five person collection. Again, that's what we simulated as being a, a single family home. And so you can see in the left, um, the first those the first virus is, the first pathogen is norovirus, and so you can see that we were able to estimate LRTs for both thousand person and five person scales, and uh, they're you know about a log different, and so there is um, there is a difference, um, but it's less than one log. However, when you go to the uh, the other pathogens, again the ones that were more rare that didn't even occur in those ninth percentile years, um, you actually because they don't occur, you don't need to treat for them at the ninth percentile, and so you end up getting these LRTs of zero, um, which you know is an interesting result because clearly, you know, we do think you need to treat the water, but, you know, based on this risk-based approach um, at the ninth percentile, they just wouldn't occur. And so technically you wouldn't need to treat for them. Um, however, I'll point out, and this is the footnote on the table, is that for these other pathogens, the 99th percentile. So if you move from saying, hey, I want to meet my, my risk target 95% of the time to 99% of the time, then we do, we are able to model stable LRGs for the other pathogens. Um, and they end up being um, similar to the those for the thousand person at the 95th percentile. And so what does this all matter? Um, you know, so I think some questions to think about here are uh, what are acceptable risk? Um, you know, does the 95th percentile versus 99th percentile, 95% versus 99% achievement of your risk target, does that matter? You know, can you, it, technically no treatment would be necessary for 95th, but there would be for the 99th. And so, you know, do you want to manage those other pathogens at a different at a different risk level, just so you can have a number to use. Um, and so some of the options you have here, you know, you could use the thousand person LRTs. This would provide consistency across different system sizes and it would provide a conservative level of protection against the rare high risk events for all the pathogens. 
And again, not extremely conservative either because for viruses is only, you know, maybe a log extra. Um, and also, you know, the other, other way to think about this too is if you just, you know, only manage for that norovirus reduction, then that might also be productive of the other pathogen class as well. You're going to have to have a significant treatment to reduce norovirus by those amounts. And so you'll probably knock down the other pathogen classes too. So that's another management option you might consider. Um, but taking a broader perspective, um, there's, I think, a, a valid question about how relevant is waterborne transmission within a household? Um, because this scale, you know, the, your pathogen exposure is, is going to be more likely from person-to-person -person interactions and shared space than it would be from water reuse. You know, you, everyone knows, you know, when someone in your house is sick, particularly with something like norovirus, everybody else gets sick too. And so um, that's not from water reuse. That's just from being, um, from sharing space, sharing phone mics with these individuals. And so um, I guess the question is, does that relative risk matter from a water policy standpoint? And so just some concluding remarks before we move on to the other speakers, we'll talk a lot about how these modeling results actually um, translate to real-world systems. Um, it's says first that the risk-based LRT estimates are available for single-family homes, um, but there's challenges that remain for their policy interpretation and their actual application and use. Um, uh, management and monitoring of in-home in -home real systems present additional complexities uh, for public health protection. Uh, these are, you know, we're talking about in being some, a system in someone's house. We all know that people fail to ma maintain their homes. And so if you fail to maintain your water reuse system, you could have some significant health impacts from that. And so how do you make sure that, you, that these are monitored and managed in a way that, that, that they operate at, at the level you think they're going to? And then finally, back to Jay's last point, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to do this. You know, we need to consider the balance of proximal risk risk when we're implementing these systems. And so with that, I'd like to thank a couple of our collaborators, Mary Shane and Nick Ashball, and pass it over to our, our next speaker. Thanks. Thanks, Michael and Jay. I uh, appreciate it. Um, and Brian uh, Pexen and Anya Kaufman are up next. And just provide a quick introduction for both Brian and Anya. They are uh, with Trussell Technologies located in Oakland, California. Um, Brian and Anya are working on several potable and non-potable reuse projects in California. And in addition, they re in addition, they recently assisted California regulators to evaluate the risk-based treatment targets for upcoming regulations related to municipal scale, direct potable reuse, and building scale on-site non-potable reuse. So uh, welcome, Anya and Brian. <clears throat> Thanks, Paula. So I think we're just hearing from Mike in the last talk and from Paula at the beginning that one of the most challenging aspects for developing one of these programs for on-site non-potable water systems that we're gonna call ONWS is determining what level of treatment's required for the different source waters that you might use and uh, and how you use them in the end, the different end uses. And our, our goal is obviously the protection of public health. And so we've been helping SFPUC with ONWS for the last several years. And, and over this time, we've seen the rise of different types of reuse. And so rather than trying to do a one-off evaluation for every new source water and end use, we thought it'd be helpful to put together a framework to evaluate single family home reuse applications. And so the goals of this presentation are to present the framework that we developed to evaluate the treatment requirements for various single family source waters and end use and then show how we applied this framework to three specific cases, including household gray water systems, recirculating showers, and recirculating washing machines. So if we step back and look at what we've done in the past and where we're going, I think Mike talked about this um, to some degree. To date, we've mostly focused on building scale rather than single family home scale. And we've looked at how to use the various source waters that you might collect in a building for two end uses primarily. It's um, toilet flushing and irrigation. And in both of these cases, the principal exposure out has been the incidental ingestion of this water. So as we switch now over to the single family home scale, we're already aware that there's gonna be additional end uses that might require um, consideration of exposure beyond this incidental ingestion. And so we wanted to develop a framework that would provide us a consistent approach to evaluate these new end uses as well. And so on this next slide, we're looking at a schematic of the framework that um, has the goal of public health protection for single family home scenarios. And you can see that there's 
five steps here. And so we'll start with the first step and that is defining our end uses. And so here you can see just schematically, we're looking at toilet flushing, irrigation, recirculating showers and recirculating washing machines. And of course, other applications could be added to this framework as technologies evolve and um, we include additional end uses. And the second step, it's determining exposures. And this is an important thing to define because the type of exposure pathways, um, um, there are a number of different types of exposure pathways that might be relevant for the population. And these pathways can include things like ingestion that we've talked about, but also inhalation and then contact of this water with skin and mucous membranes. So um, in the third step, it's identifying the relative the relevant pathogens. And um, when we know what are the type of exposures that people might have, then we can that can help us to identify the pathogens that would be relevant um, for control. So we've talked about the importance of enteric pathogens and um, for the ingestion of these ONWS waters. But if inhalation was an important exposure pathway, then we might also include respiratory pathogens, such as Legionella. Similarly, if we have extensive contact with the skin and mucous membranes, then we might consider pathogens um, such as Staphylococcus aureus. All right, so these different source waters have different concentrations of pathogens, and then different end uses will expose us to different volumes of water. And we can put those two things together, concentration and volume to determine the number of pathogens might be present during an exposure event. And here I'm just schematically showing these exposures as low, moderate, and high. And ultimately in the fifth step, what we wanna do is um, a treatment approach that helps to protect public health. And so Mike did a good job describing these risk-based treatment goals already. Um, so we could use those, but we could also consider other approaches for pathogen control, including best management practices. And so to the extent that these frameworks have been developed for, for applications that are relevant to ONWS, then they might also be acceptable for establishing pathogen, pathogen control. And finally, we might have strategies, strategies to address other water quality concerns. So for example, if we're using UV, uh, disinfection, then we that would typically require that we use a feed water with a low turbidity so that that UV light can, you know, actually go and hit those pathogens. And if that's the case, then we might need to specify filtration as a pretreatment um, before, before UV. There's other aesthetic issues that might be important as well, like color and odor, um, if that's going to, uh, you know, impact the public's acceptance of the water. And so next we're gonna look at how we use this framework by, by applying it to three different case studies, all of them involving the use of gray water recycling. And I'm gonna pass it to, to Anya to walk through those case studies. Great, thanks, Brian. Yes, so I'm gonna walk through a few case studies using this framework that Brian just prevented, uh, presented. And the first is a single family gray water system. And so if we use this framework, um, we first need to define the end uses for the system. And so for a single family gray water system, the likely end uses are toilet flushing, irrigation, and clothes washing. So if we go to step two, based on these end uses, we can then define our exposures. And the primary exposure pathway from these end uses is incidental ingestion. And the relevant microbial threats of concern then are the enteric pathogens. But in addition, there is potential for contact with skin and mucous membranes if we think about clothes washing and irrigation, as well as inhalation exposure during toilet flushing and irrigation. So these exposure pathways and associated relevant pathogens were also considered. So then to quantify exposure, we need to think about the source water pathogen concentrations and then the volume of exposure. And so in the system, we can envision collecting from one or more sources. So things like bathroom sinks, bathtub, showers, washing machines, conveying them to a central location and then distributing it. So we couple pathogen data from these types of sources with our exposure assumptions. 
So we use similar exposure assumptions here as were used for building scale systems, including the potential for accidental cross connection. And that really would result from a plumbing modification to a house with a single family gray water system. So this accidental cross connection could also address accidental ingestion, such as a child consuming non-potable gray water that was intended for irrigation, say. So graphically, we're showing this exposure as a relatively moderate level of exposure. And so using all of this information, the next step in step five is then to develop the treatment approach. So let's focus in on the resulting treatment approach for these gray water systems. So first we developed risk-based treatment targets for these systems using quantitative microbial risk assessment like Jay and Michael talked about. So we first looked at the enteric pathogens, virus, giardia, and crypto, and we utilized the models for the five-person scale that Michael previously described and presented. And so in line with previous log reduction target development, like Michael also discussed, we used the 95th percentile LRT to establish the treatment target. However, we know that in some cases, these models indicated that for some pathogens, there will be no members of the household who are infected at certain times. And again, Michael did a great job showing that. And so this low occurrence of pathogens at these five person scales sometimes meant that an LRT of zero would be acceptable at the 95th percentile. And while that would provide adequate protection most of the time, it would be inadequate during those rare occasions when pathogens are present. And so for this reason, we recommended the use of the 99th percentile value when the 95th percentile value was zero. So based on this analysis, we would need virus log reduction of eight based on the 95th percentile and Giardia and crypto log reductions of four based on that 99th percentile. Now, recall that we also wanted to control against skin and mucous membrane pathogens. And so previous work by Mary Shane and others has shown that three log reduction of Staph aureus would be sufficient for showering with gray water. And so because we know that our exposure due to clothes washing and irrigation is anticipated to be less than the exposure due to showering, and because our log reduction targets for the viral and protozoan enteric pathogens are greater than three log, and we know that bacteria are typically more susceptible to treatment than virus and protozoa, we determined that we would not need separate requirements for those skin and mucus pathogens and the requirements that we have for the enteric should, should suffice. And then finally, we have several additional treatment considerations for the system. So the first is to match the EPA reclaimed water recommendations for BOD and turbidity. Um, we also want to ensure that ammonia is removed, for example, if free chlorine disinfection is utilized. Um, we recommend maintaining a chlorine residual as well as a best management practice to control Legionella. And we also want to ensure continuous process performance via monitoring. We want to make sure that any processes that we have that are providing this treatment are actually doing what they're supposed to do. And so with all of this information and all of these treatment requirements and criteria, we can begin to think about what a treatment system might actually look like. And a treatment train that's capable of meeting these criteria is shown here on the bottom of the slide. So we have a membrane bioreactor that helps to address BOD and turbidity. We then have UV at a dose of 160 millijoules per centimeter squared to provide six log reduction of virus, Giardia, and crypto. And then we have a free chlorine um, at a CT of seven milligram minutes per liter to provide an additional two log reduction of virus so that we can meet the virus log reduction target of eight. And so clearly this is a really robust treatment train and this is one option potentially for, for meeting these goals. Um, but we really wanted to show the criteria on the same page as this train so that it's clear what's driving the inclusion of these multiple processes. 
Okay, so that was the first case study. The next case study that we looked at was a recirculating shower. And this is a shower that collects and treats used shower water and recirculates it back into the shower as a source water. So the end use in this case is only for showers because the extent of the collection and distribution of this loop for this treatment technology is really minimized to an isolated location. So if we think about the exposures that you might have in a shower, all three, ingestion, inhalation, and skin contact are relevant here. So here we evaluated the enteric pathogen, Staph aureus, and Legionella as well. For exposure, we assumed that individuals would ingest 10 milliliters of water per shower. However, for this case, we removed the assumption of accidental cross-connection that we were using before, given that this system would have a small and isolated footprint associated with it and would be less likely to have some kind of cross-connection occur. But that said, this 10 milliliters is a fairly high volume, so here we're quantifying this as a relatively high exposure. So again, using this framework, let's focus in on the resulting treatment approach for the shower system. And so again, using quantitative microbial risk assessment and adapted data from Michael Jane's simulations for showers, we end up with log reduction target requirements of 10 log for virus, six log for Giardia and crypto. And one of the main reasons that this number is higher than we saw for the gray water system is really due to the assumption about exposure, particularly that assumption that people might drink a mouthful of this water each day they shower. And so this is much higher than the incidental ingestion that might occur via toilet flushing or irrigation. Yeah. Excuse me. As with the gray water system, this level of treatment um, would provide adequate protection against skin and mucus pathogens as well. So a separate bacterial requirement was not added in this case. And here we recognize that Legionella is a particularly important issue for showers. So these systems really should include a means to control the growth of opportunistic pathogens. And one option here would be to require the maintenance of a chlorine residual or some other approach that can reliably demonstrate that concentrations of these opportunistic pathogens are kept at low levels in the shower head. Again, the water quality goals that EPA set out for reclaimed water also seem reasonable for recirculating showers. So that's the low turbidity and BOD, which are also in line with the NSF 350. And again, monitoring is critical to ensure that these processes are meeting their performance goals. So given these treatment requirements, a potential treatment train is shown in the figure at the bottom. And like the gray water system shown before, this is robust treatment. Um, and consists of the same unit processes, MBR, UV, and free chlorine. But you can see that the free chlorine has a slightly different design criteria with a higher CT in order to meet the higher virus log reduction target. So the last case study that we looked at was a recirculating clothes washer. And so in this scenario, dirty water from a clothes washer is collected and treated and recirculated to then be used as a source for the clothes washer. So the end use in this case is clothes washing. Given this end use, the primary exposure pathway is ingestion via hand to mouth contact. So we focused on the enteric pathogens again, but there's also limited contact with skin and mucous membranes when handling wet clothes. And so in this case, we did not believe there to be a likely exposure via inhalation. To quantify exposure, we used previous assumptions for clothes washing exposure and also the concentrations of enteric pathogens were estimated based on Michael Jane's models for laundry at the five person scale. And so if we look at what the treatment approach looks like for this, um, the recommended enteric pathogen log reductions are seven log for virus and two and a half log for Giardia and crypto. No additional treatment requirements were specified for skin and mucus pathogens based on the same rationale as the other two case studies. Um, and the other water quality considerations are also identical to the other reuse systems, namely control of VOD and turbidity and a method for controlling Legionella. Now controlling for Legionella um, for this system would be a conservative approach, but you could allow vendors, for example, to propose alternatives if they can demonstrate that aerosol exposures are negligible. Um, an additional consideration for this system 
is that it may be particularly sensitive to aesthetics. So color and odor may also need to be addressed because we don't want our clothes to be dirty or smelly. And then finally, as with all other treatment systems, we recommend online monitoring for the system to provide continuous confirmation of the system performance. So again, model treatment train, a potential train that is capable of meeting these criteria is shown in the figure at the bottom, and it's the same three processes, but again, with a slightly different free chlorine CT to achieve the virus LRT. And so this concludes our three case studies, and now I'm going to hand it back to Brian to talk more about the unique challenges that face the implementation of these single-family household reuse systems. Yeah, thanks, Anya. So there's several implementation topics that we need to consider that are going to be different as we go from building scale down to the single family home scale. And one of the important considerations is, is project oversight. And so for building scale on site on potable water systems in San Francisco, the regulators there are involved throughout the lifetime of the project. So starting with the design, the regulators are giving feedback to ONWS projects, and they continue to have feedback in subsequent steps like construction, startup, <clears throat> and commissioning. And even once the project has received the green light to distribute water, the regulators continue to be involved via their review of ongoing monitoring and reports. And so I think we can all appreciate that this is an important feedback loop that we have at the building scale since it provides this assurance that the system's designed and then is being reliably uh, operated to meet our treatment and water quality goals. So I think we have really similar treatment and water quality goals between building scale and single family ONWS, but clearly there's not gonna be this consistent oversight from regulators over the life of the, the project. And so a different paradigm is needed. We have other implementation models um, that, that we could look at, including those proposed by NSF, such as with their standard 350. And in this model, products are tested and certified prior to being installed at a house, but then it doesn't require additional validation after, after the system's been installed. And so um, this testing that's through something like NSF includes things like performance criteria, um, but also has requirements for, for monitoring and alarming, making sure that the product's robust and won't break down, and then also ensuring that there are fail-safe features. And so whatever the alternatives are, um, they must provide confidence that these systems are gonna be providing adequate protection of public health without this ongoing regulatory oversight. And so if we go to some findings and conclusions, what you saw here is this framework that we developed to evaluate risk-based treatment and water quality requirements for single family source waters and end uses. We ap apply this fr framework to develop log reduction targets and water quality goals for three specific applications. That the LRTs that Anya discussed are based on the best available data and the use of conservative assumptions. And like Mike began with in his presentation, clearly there are some knowledge gaps in this new field and you know, the, the sort of relative lack of data related to single family gray water, um, the quality of the gray water and pathogen concentrations is, is a knowledge gap that we're, that we're filling with, with things like the models that, that Mike described. Um, and finally, the, the single family ONWS, Clearly, this introduces new challenges for implementation that we haven't encountered in, in building scale paradigms. And so moving forward with this will we'll require, you know, a thoughtful consideration about how to make sure that we're protecting public health at these at, at the single family scale. And so just quickly, I want to acknowledge uh, teammates at, at Trussell Tech, Brandon and Bree, been working um, for several years with Paula and Taylor at SFPUC. And Annie and I, uh, you know, gained a lot from interacting with Michael Jane and Mary Shane um, uh, on this topic. So I wanted to acknowledge them as well. Great. Thank you, Brian and Anya. Appreciate that. And um, our last presentation will be from Eberhard Morgenroth um, and Ava Renhart from AVAG. 
um, just quickly, Eberhard is the head of the processing engineering department. Uh, his research includes wastewater treatment, membrane bioreactors, as well as decentralized wastewater treatment and energy recovery from wastewater. Uh, he's the editor in chief for water research. And Eva is also with AVAG, and she's been focused, uh, her research has been focused on understanding health risks um, from on site water reuse and developing risk based monitoring strategies for such systems. Um, and just as a reminder, if you could please, uh, if you have a question, put it in the QA, and we plan to get to that uh, shortly. So thank you. Turning it thank over now. Thank you, Paula. Good morning, and good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And welcome to this third part of today's webinar. I will be the one presenting our study, but Eberhard is also here to answer questions at the end of the webinar. So our study on pathogen removal targets for single family water reuse that I will talk about is very much based on the work that Jay and Michael presented in the first part of the webinar. We will also expand the three case studies that Brian and Anya just presented, but with a focus on only enteric pathogen removal. So the seminar is focused on water reuse at the scale of a single family. And what I find really interesting when scaling down water reuse to the scale of a family or even to appliance scale is that such systems do not longer need the large scale infrastructure to collect wastewater or distribute treated water. So this really opens up the possibility of what types of wastewater we want to treat for what types of applications. And in this way, allows us to really tailor systems to specific needs and specific contexts. So on this slide, I just want to give you a glimpse of the range of technologies that can either treat mixed gray water for non-potable applications or that recycle water at an appliance scale. So all of these systems you see here, toilets that would recycle flush water or recycling hand washing water or recycle um, water from washing machines, treat wastewaters or gray waters with a different level of fecal contamination for applications that are associated with different levels of exposure of users to that reclaimed water. So now the question is really, what does this mean in terms of microbial risks? So, Um, there are different drivers for on-site water reuse. One is, of course, water scarcity, as is the case in San Francisco, but some places also simply lack centralized water and wastewater infrastructure. So EAVAG, the research institute that I work for, has been involved in the development of two novel te technologies that recycle water in a closed loop. One is um, a toilet that recycles source separated toilet flush water. So that's flush water that has been separated from the urine and from the major part of the feces. Um, that, that is what you see on this upper picture here where we tested such a recycling toilet in a single family context in South Africa. The second technology we worked on is a recycling hand washing station. So a system that recycles hand washing water in a closed loop, which you see here implemented in an informal settlement in South Africa. And during technology development and field testing, we were confronted with several questions that I believe are relevant beyond our specific technologies. So one question is, what water quality targets do we need for specific uses of specific wastewaters. So if you think about that recycling hand washing station, the hand washing gray water is less fecally contaminated than other types of wastewaters, but at the same time, 
users have this direct contact with the water. So what does this mean in terms of quality targets we have to mean? And the second question that we will talk about today is whether these quality targets depend on scale. It's something you have also heard in the other presentations already. So we, we have systems here that really work at the scale of a single family. We have a system that works at the scale of an informal settlement with several hundreds or potentially a thousand users. And I think what is important here is that while the context of informal settlements in South Africa may be quite different from the situation in San Francisco, the questions we have about safe water reuse are just the same. So this question of pathogen treatment targets as a function of both the scale and the reuse application will also be the primary focus of my presentation here today. So we will look at enteric pathogen removal targets at two collection scales. One is the single family scale consisting of five people. The other one is a large building or potentially an informal settlement with represented by a thousand people. Um, and we will look at seven different reuse applications. And now I will need your attention for a moment because I will reuse these abbreviations throughout the presentation. So we looked at appliance scale reuse where we investigated the recycling of source separated toilet flush water. We looked at recycling washing machines. We looked at recycling hand washing stations and we looked at recycling showers. So two of these scenarios you already saw in the presentation by Brian and Anya before. We then also looked at the combined treatment of, of all of these four sources, either for all types of non-potable reuse applications, that's the um, reuse application I call GW. Then as a boundary condition, we looked at potable reuse, and I want to emphasize that's really only as a boundary condition. Jay already mentioned that for potable reuse, we have many more challenges than just the removal of enteric pathogens. And as the last and seventh uh, reuse application, the reuse for irrigation. So we have our two collection scales, seven reuse applications makes 14 reuse scenarios. And for each of these, we looked at six reference pathogens that were selected for their high prevalence and for their resistance to treatment, two protozoa, two bacteria, and two viruses. For each of these scenarios, for each reference pathogen, we, calcul we calculated log removal targets to meet a certain health outcome benchmark which we set to 10 to the power of minus four infections per person per year. And to assess the practical implications of these dif of differences in log removal targets, we then assembled simplified treatment trains, which are coincidentally very similar to what Trussell's uh, presented before. So we chose membrane bioreactors as a baseline treatment complemented this with chlorination to meet log removal targets and added UV disinfection if membrane bioreactors and chlorination would not be sufficient. For each of these treatment processes and for each reference pathogen, uh, we used log removal values from literature whenever possible based on actual pathogen removal data and in some cases, based on conservative surrogates. So the first step in establishing risk-based pathogen treatment targets, targets is to look at pathogen concentrations. So Michael mentioned before how challenging it is to measure pathogen concentration in a single family context or in on-site systems in general. So we, we rely on, on this same epidemiology-based model that Michael presented before. And here I will use norovirus um, to present, um, to, to illustrate the differences in pathogen concentrations. So in this plot here, you see the distribution 
of norovirus at two different scale in each gray water source. On the upper part of the plot, you see this percentage. That's the occurrence of pathogens in the gray water. So it's the percentage of days of a year during which norovirus is present in the gray water. We see that for the single family case, the occurrence is only around 3%. So most of the time, we do not have norovirus in the gray water. In contrast, if we look at the large building, the occurrence is almost 100%. So we almost always have norovirus in our gray water sources. Um, you also have, or you have additional numbers on the lower parts of the plot. So that's the mean concentration when occurring. And if we look at the mean concentration of norovirus in, in mixed gray water in the single family case, you see that it's around 4.6 log compared to 3.6 log in the larger system. So this is also something Michael mentioned before. The smaller the system, the less dilution we have when a person is sick. We can also use um, this plot to compare the mean concentration in the different gray water sources, where we see that um, gray water providing from washing machine is least polluted, while source separated toilet flush water is the most polluted source. So these differences in both the occurrence of pathogens as a function of the scale and um, the concentration of pathogens as a function of the gray water source are really super important because of the implications this has on the log removal targets. So we will start by looking at the effect of the scale on the log removal targets. What I show you here are the 95% quantiles of log removal targets, just as you saw in Brian's and Anya's presentation before. So these log removal targets correspond to the treatment we need to ensure that we meet the health benchmark in 95% of the years. And I present these log removal targets for each of our six reference pathogens. So that's the rows and for each of our reuse applications. That's the columns we have here. And for now, we will focus only on the colors. And I think what is striking when you compare the left-hand plot with the right-hand plot is that in the left-hand plot, the single family, you have a lot of yellow. And this is because for these pathogens, um, we don't need any level of pathogen removal to meet the health benchmark in 95% of the years. While if we look at the larger scale building, we see that there are red colors everywhere. So for these reference pathogens, we need some level of treatment to meet the health benchmark. However, if we look at the two very last rows, that's viruses, norovirus and adenovirus, we see that these are dark red, even in the single family case. So the log removal targets for the most prevalent viruses are high, even at the family scale. We can use the same graph to also compare the effect of the different reuse applications. So on this slide, I'm really just zooming into the same graph you saw before. And if we now start looking at numbers, you will notice that I actually present two numbers uh, for each virus lock removal target. Uh, these two numbers compare uh, correspond to different dose response models. So these dose response models are used to evaluate the probability of infection of people when exposed to a certain dose of pathogens. And we see that the selection of a dose response model can change the log removal target we need by around three log for norovirus. So now if we compare the different columns, so the different reuse applications, we see that the numbers or the shades of red are quite different for the different reuse applications. 
for instance, if we compare a recycling washing machine with a system that recycles mixed gray water, we see that the log removal targets are lower by around three log. If we wanted to go all the way to potable reuse, and I remind you that this is only a boundary condition, we would need around three log more removal. So now the important question for practice is how do these differences in log removal targets translate into differences in treatment train requirements? So on this plot, I show the required treatment train with the color, co color code you saw before, again, for each reference pathogen, the rows, and for each reuse application, the columns. And we see that in the single family case, for most reference pathogens, a membrane bioreactor would be sufficient, which makes a lot of sense because you saw before that the 95% quantile of log removal targets was zero for these pathogens because of the low occurrence in the single family um, reuse context. However, again, if we look at the last two rows, our viruses, we need quite advanced treatment for most reuse applications. So for most applications, we would need the, the entire treatment train of membrane bioreactor with UV disinfection with chlorination, and only for recycling washing machine and recycling hand washing station, membrane bioreactors with chlorination may be sufficient. If we compare this to the second plot, we see that the final treatment trains for each reuse application are not so different in this larger scale scenario. However, the treatment trains are defined or determined by more different reference, reference pathogens in this case, not only viruses. So we saw enteric pathogen log removal targets. We saw the associated treatment trains required for single family reuse. And still, I think it's very important to emphasize that this reflects the current state of science. And we do have a lot of different open questions that were partially raised by the previous presentations. So I would like to quickly talk about three examples. One is the uncertainty in log removal targets. The second is the uncertainty in treatment trains. And the last is the question, um, how do you ensure that the log removal targets are always met dur during operation? So the log removal targets are derived from quantitative microbial risk assessment which is a relatively straightforward and transparent framework to assess the effect of water reuse on human health. However, the certainty we have in the results obviously depends on the quality of the input. And the current challenge we are facing is the very limited availability of data especially when we start looking into specific gray water sources or very specific reuse applications. So we have uncertainties on all levels in the epidemiology-based model, of course. We also have very limited data uh, in terms of exposure to reclaimed water. So in the Q&A before, I saw a question asking, does it really make sense to assume that uh, people ingest 10 milliliters of water while showering. The honest answer is there is not so much data on this. You saw before the effect of just selecting different types of pathogen dose response models. Uh, Michael from the US EPA already raised the question about the selection of adequate health benchmarks for a single family context. So there is really a lot of uncertainties in these models due to the limited data we have at this stage. So the picture I included here is really just to give you a bit of a feeling for the, for the type of data we are using. So here I show you E. coli concentrations that we need as an input for the epidemiology-based data. It's the distribution of, of E. coli in 
gray water from washing machines. And what you see here is that for high concentrations of E. coli here, it's very few data points that define the shape of this distribution. The second question was the uncertainty in treatment trains. And we observed that the differences in log removal targets do not always translate into differences in treatment train requirements. So this is what I'm uh, exemplifying here, where we saw that we have tree log differences in log removal targets between potable and non-potable water reuse. But in the end, we require just the same type of treatment trains. And this lack of translation of the differences in log removal targets into differences in treatment trains is partially also a, con a consequence of conservative pathogen log removal values we selected for the unit processes. So we tried to work mostly with actual pathogen log removals. And these are often based on data sets where the pathogen concentration in the treated water is below the detection limit. This means that the log removal we can then calculate is defined only by the detection limit and the concentration of pathogens in the gray water or in the wastewater source. So for instance, we had to cap uh, the log removal of norovirus at five for chlorination just because there is no study that would demonstrate a higher removal of norovirus by chlorination. And there is the possibility that new pathogen data um, collected with um, methods that would have a lower limit of detection will allow us to validate higher log removal values and potentially allow for simpler treatment trains in some cases. The last question is how to ensure that log removal targets are met at all times. And I think it is very important to recognize that the log removal targets we presented here assumes that the treatment always works in order to meet the health outcome benchmarks. So they do not account for any even short-term failure. So what centralized systems would typically do is that they include process redundancy to account for treatment failure, which is likely economically not feasible and not sensible in, in small-scale systems. So on-site systems or small-scale systems will rely even more on reliable monitoring and management approaches. At EAVAC, we've worked quite a bit on membrane bioreactors with chlorination, where we tested the ability of several commercially available sensors to predict the microbial water quality in such systems. I will not go into any level of detail right now, but what we saw is that there are suitable low costs and low maintenance sensors that are closely related with the microbial water quality. However, if we think about practical implementation, it's well, this, these monitoring approaches will be technology specific. So there may not be low cost and low maintenance sensors for any type of technology. So this is my very last slide. If we wrap up what we saw in my presentation, I think is that scaling down water reuse to single family does not offer benefits in terms of treatment we need compared to a larger system because of these high log removal targets for viruses. In contrast, appliance scale water reuse can allow for simpler treatment in some case. Still, I will conclude on the remark that this assessment may still change in the future with new data to reduce the uncertainty in log removal targets, new data to validate higher log removal values for treatment trains. But, and this is important, always assuming that we can adequately monitor these systems. Thank you, Eva. That was fantastic. I really appreciate your presentation. I just wanted to share uh, one last slide before we get into the Q&A. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot about the state of the science today, um, but we also know there's a lot of questions still remaining in terms of single family uh, water reuse applications. So what the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission has done is that we've uh, organized an independent expert advisory panel 
Uh, we have 12 panel members from around the world to assess the feasibility of single family water recycling by looking at, are there alternative risk management approaches like from the, what was presented today? Um, are there other approaches uh, available for maintaining necessary operation and maintenance? Um, how can we validate these systems and then look at life cycle costs and impacts on household scale implementation? Um, our work uh, has just kicked off and we expect a report um, in June of 2024. So again, I would like to thank all of our panelists, um, Michael, Jay, Brian, Anya, and Eva and Eberhard. And now I think we'll move over to the Q&A um, and we'll start with the first question that's been asked. Uh, it, this presentation is being recorded. Um, and also a question was being asked about um, about uh, slides and we will make both of those available. Um, we did have a question about, uh, did the San Francisco's ordinance establish management requirements? And yes, and there are a number of management requirements. Uh, I will also be happy to put the link into our program, um, into the, our link to our program uh, with the materials following the webinar. Um, there's a question about the regulatory status of potable atmospheric water systems such as uh, source. I don't have an updated uh, regulatory status and I don't know if any of the other panelists uh, have an update. Nope, I don't. Yeah. I, I would say the only thing, if it's if it's any source of water that's being used for drinking water and, and they're supplying it to more than 20 people, that's considered a, a, a community uh, water source and, and it would be uh, it would be regulated as as such. Um, but if it's smaller in scale, uh, then there really would not be regulatory oversight. And that, that's just for generally for, you know, for any kind of uh, uh, drinking water supply. The atmospheric water is a specific source that we've done a little bit of work on that. That's not really reuse as such, but it, it is an alternative water source. Um, and and uh, there's still some work to be done on what what the risk assessment really is for that water quality. The assumption is that it's clean, um, but you need to understand what uh, both uh, the kind of Legionella and other environmental contaminants might be accumulated in that, as well as chemicals, volatile chemicals that may be in the water. So there's there's still active research on that. And that's, a, that's an area that I think is gonna continue to develop. I know we, Mike and I, we get, we get the, a lot of um, requests about that a research area more so than and the, all the work that we talked about today. It really does seem to be something that that is going to uh, increase in scope over the years. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question regarding NSF 350. Um, if NSF 350 also included protozoa and virus tests, would it be able, would it be folded into the risk based approach, and would a spike challenge test be required? Yeah, I think this question actually speaks to kind of a, a, a fundamental difference between the indicator endpoint approach versus the LRT approach. And so, um, you know, when with the end, endpoint tech, tech approaches like N350, they say if you have a certain level of E. coli in your water, then that, that shows that it was reducing concentrations enough. Um, what we say in this in LRT model is that, that uses LRV approach is that you have a system, it's it, and you're doing some, the, the manufacturer probably is is challenge testing that system to show that it can remove viruses and protozoa at a certain level because um, you have to, um, you're gonna have to do some challenge testing to do that because it, your, your effluent is gonna be so low concentrations. I talked about how our influence could be challenging to measure, effluent's even harder to measure. And so you can get non-detects of viruses in your effluent and your system might still not be performing well. And so you need to, you need to validate your system for the removal that can actually achieve. And so what you do is you, um, you'll do some validation testing to say, hey, under these conditions, my system reduces viruses and protozoa by X amount. And then, you know, by demonstrating that robustly, as long as your system can be shown to operate within that window, then you know it's re it's achieving the removal that it's credited for. And that's why we talk about why monitoring is so important for these systems. Yeah, I mean, it really does shift the monitoring from the endpoint water quality analysis to the treatment system itself. And, and Eva mentioned about the, the challenges in, in, in developing those kind of surrogates, right? That you would be measuring to ensure that your system is performing as designed, but not necessarily focused on the water quality. I, I, despite those challenges in developing those kind of surrogate monitoring approaches, I, I think it is the way to go because if you're focused on pathogen monitoring in the effluent, 
you you're always going to be a day late and a dollar short in the sense that it's going to take time to get those results back and it's going to be very costly unless there's very rapid advancements in our ability to detect those pathogens and it's very difficult because of the low low concentrations i might note that there's a lot of existing frameworks um, surrogate-based frameworks for pathogen crediting that people can rely on. And so <clears throat> I don't think that, um, like, you know, challenge testing would be required for all unit processes if you use one of those frameworks. But I think there's another question later on here, you know, just the practical side of this, um, you know, getting credit for chlorine disinfection requires the measurement of a chlorine residual and also the contact time in order to calculate a CT. And I think there's some questions, you know, how reasonable is it to expect that one of these chlorine residual meters would work well at a house, you know, that it would be provide accurate, reliable measurements. And I think that's a, a question that would be, you know, <laughs> to be answered. Um, you know, may, maybe it wouldn't work so well. I think Eberhard put in the um, answered questions that there's alternative frameworks. And I guess, Ava, you showed this as well you know, where you could use something like ORP instead of chlorine, which which seems good, you know, which feels like maybe that's the way to go. I think it's just worth noting that there's not an existing crediting framework that uses ORP to determine this. And so, you know, regulators or somebody would need to feel comfortable that this alternative surrogate approach is, is, um, is valid. If I Wait. can just quickly add Wait. to this, I think um, what is really important is that these surrogate parameters do not exist for all types of technologies. So my thinking is that technology developers will really have this monitorability already in mind when designing the technology. You cannot think these two separately. So it's really developing technologies in the way that they can be monitored in a small scale context. Thank you. There's a question about the LRVs required for single family homes different from dif four different end uses. The answer I believe is yes, that we've commented on that. So uh, we have a, a question about, are, are, we, are you considering including aspects of ISO 30500? Well, I, I can quickly comment on this. So the ISO standard, 3500 is a standard on prefabricated non sewered sanitation systems. And I think what we presented here is not so different from the approach taken in that ISO standard in the sense that they also use log removal targets to assess uh, the microbial water quality. The standard um, covers a lot of other requirements as well, but in terms of microbial water quality, this is very much the approach taken by the ISO standard, also based on the very study, on, on the studies that Jay and Michael presented at the beginning of this webinar. Great, thank you. Uh, we addressed the comment about, about the ingestion from the shower, Ava touched on that, so thank you. Um, moving on, are, are all systems um, all systems are MBR based. Have other technologies been considered as in a, a membrane essential in all cases? Eva, you want to flip? I, we, we can go. I think um, there's a couple, I think um, there's some prerequisites to doing some of this disinfection where we're getting a lot of the credit. I think you saw in Anya's slides that there's it's the UV and the chlorine that are um, really the workhorses for this pathogen credit. And there's some prerequisites for that and in, in, in other frameworks of the municipal scale are, is that the water be filtered prior to, prior to disinfection and also that the, the water quality be suitable for, for UV say. And one of the things we look at is um, the UV transmittance of the water, um, which is, related to the amount of organics in the water. And so um, one way to ensure that the, the water is suitable for disinfection is to reduce those organics through biological treatment, for example, and then also do some sort of filtration to remove particulates. And um, one, one technology that we know that works well at doing both of those things and can you know occupy a relatively small footprint is an MBR. So the, the 
I think the answer is, do you have to use MBR? No, but I think the sort of water quality that results from an MBR is, 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 is a requirement. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question regarding the LRTs, uh, the LRTs are a useful tool, um, as well as the previous guidelines from the Blue Ribbon Commission that provides credits. Um, however, how would new innovative technologies be managed for LRT credits? I think that goes back to my, my comment earlier too about the way this systems work is you would have to, you know, validate, you would have to show it, demonstrate that your system can achieve the specified virus and protozoan removals. Um, and so, you know, whether to Brian's point, you know, what for existing technologies, there might be frameworks established for that, but for newer technologies, it would probably be, be again, be on the burden of the manufacturer to demonstrate that their, um, that their system can achieve the reductions that are required. And there's another a question associated to the log in a, inactivation values. Where are they coming from? It, it doesn't appear to meet NSF uh, according to NSF 55 standards. So there's some confusion. I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Yeah, and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the question is related to the LRTs or actually like the credit that you're getting from. The credit, yeah, I believe with the credit, yeah. Yeah, and I think for the NSF, but Mike, jump in if, if you want. The, the NSF, really, we're just looking to try to, um, you know, set up a treatment system that achieves this effluent standard. And so you could use really a, a number of different technologies so long as the, you know, these indicator bacteria are, are at low concentrations in the effluent. And um, so there's not really a, a requirement to provide X logs of reduction of, 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 of anything. You know, really it's do whatever it takes to get these bacterial concentrations low. For the risk-based framework, there really is this requirement to, to, to quantify and then demonstrate that you're getting specific log values through each of your unit processes so that they sum up to at least the, the minimum LRT. And so, so I think that would be a huge difference between these is that there's not going to be log reduction targets for, for, for something like NSF 55, or am I thinking of the right one? NSF 55 does not have log reduction targets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And so, so that, that'll be a major, that'll be the, I think the principal difference. Great. Uh, we have a question about in terms of implementation, is there pilot funding available from NAWI or EPA or others to validate? Um, on on site uh, water systems for the protection of public health. We don't have any specific programs here at EPA. We do have the Small Business Innovation Program, which I encourage people to check out. Um, you know where we can, and they actually recently have been funding systems for um, improving decentralized uh, wastewater treatment, which could also, I think, apply to on site systems. And so there was that, that call recently closed, um, but um, certainly keep an eye on that program. I can put the link in the chat as well. Great, thank you. Um, how do you include the risk assessment um, for the probability that the treatment system fails, not not granting LRTs? So yeah. failure related. Yes. Thanks, Anya. Yeah. So for this one, we we could actually incorporate some kind of probability of failure in our risk assessment in our modeling. But one of the challenges here is that we don't actually have great data on how often these treatment systems fail and when they do fail you know what is the severity of that failure so we could include it and make some more assumptions here um or instead kind of what we're recommending here is to instead have continuous monitoring that shows you know when we're looking at a treatment process for example we we know whether it's performing or not and then if it's not performing the recommendation would be that that water is not being utilized so instead of building these failures into our assessment which would elevate our lrts even more um we'd rather just recommend having this continuous monitoring great thank you um, question regarding retention time and water age is likely to be greater for recycling clothes washers than recycling showers. Is that reflected in the in the LRTs for those applications or those two uses? My, my understanding, I think our assumption in this modeling is that the water that's used for the clothes washer you know, it's it's just used once. Like when a when a clothes washing cycle starts, you would get new, like fresh potable water. 
and that the water would get treated and um, recycled just back for that clothes washing cycle. And so um, I, I hope I'm answering the question, but I think the retention time water age would be would be very low in, in that scenario. You know, um, it would just get used during the over the time period of a, a washing cycle. And I yeah, think yeah. similarly for the recycling showers as well, that the, the um, you know, some of the technologies that we've um, seen so far are, are not storing water, um, but just really using it for the individual who's showering at the time of, of showering. Yeah, and our models are based on fresh collections of, of water. And so we do not account for any attenuation that might occur during storage. And that was intentional. And so, um, you know, if you think that you're going to get a reduction from your storage, you know, then that is something that you could, you know, try to get credits for. But, um, you know, our models assume that it's fresh, it's fresh wastewater. So that's not accounted for. There are appliances. I'm not aware of washing machines, but the, uh, of dishwashers where you actually use the last rinse for the next cycle. So, yes, the storage will occur. And that might be to the benefit or to the detriment of, of quality. Great. In terms of the data, um, do we have any uh, from existing installations? So in other words, comparing applied data um, from the field with model predictions. So I don't know the epidemiology side exactly um, in terms of the like the infection occurrence in family homes. Um, but certainly, um, you know, I, I think it's a, a challenging to validate these models in terms of the pathogen densities, like I mentioned. Um, and so we have done some, you know, limited exploration to see, you know, how do these models compare to the actual pathogen densities that are measured. And so I showed that one slide um, that for uh, for wastewater and actually the model agreed um, pretty well. And it, and it really did show some of the hypotheses that we had that we had emphasized this variability on the, all the speakers I've talked about. Um, for gray water, we did also try to me measure gray water, um, but we encountered the exact challenges that I mentioned. You know, we had really low levels of detections. We had trouble recovering viruses from gray water collections, um, you know, because it is, you know, a, a cleaner water source. And so um, it is very challenging to validate these models. And so um, it is a recognized limitation. And certainly more data collection on on-site systems, you know, if we can figure out how to do it in a smart way or alternatively other ways to validate other inputs in the model, you know, for instance, the E. coli concentrations in gray water, you know, that would be, you know, those improvements would 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 actually would help us to better, you know, improve the the model outputs, even if we can't validate the the final pathogen concentration itself. Great. Uh, next question is, is that the the building scale has been based on for the small scales, five people. Um, have you considered the risk for just one individual? when the user is the system of and is the pathogen host. So just an individual person. You know, we haven't looked at that. And I think that the reason that, you know, that isn't necessarily important is because that person's already sick. And so they're not going to get, you know, if they already have a, say, a norovirus infection, they're not going to re get reinfected from, you know, using their own water again. Um, we're really worried about them, that, that, that their, their infection then getting other people ill who are using the same system. Um, however, I will say that there is a risk of them getting a new infection. And so if these systems are allowing the growth of things like Legionella, then that would be, you know, a different public health concern that they would still need to be concerned about. And, and then Brian talked about some of those during his presentation. Yeah, and Mike, I think for the single, um, sorry, for the recirculating shower as well, we're really considering a single person. So that, that would be one example of a single person versus five. Yep. Great. Um, there's a question about uh, a five-person sized MBR unit. Do these exist? I think, Ava, you had talked about some. I'm not sure if you have um, at that so small size. The answer is yes. Some wood MBR treatment plants exist on the market. And this is maybe also related to another question. I will just link to this uh, because it goes in a similar direction which is the challenges of operating and maintaining then such very small systems or such very small MBR systems when even at building scale, people are struggling to operate and maintain these. And I think this is a very valid question. And we cannot assume that we can just scale down the very same technologies to a, to a single family um, scale. So. At EAVAC, for instance, we have done a lot of research on developing developing membrane bioreactors that will, would require very, very little maintenance. We call this a gravity-driven membrane, where you will need a larger membrane surface for water treated, 
but then you do not need any back flushing or cleaning of the membrane. So there's always a, a, a bit of a trade-off in operation and maintenance and, and maybe capital cost of these systems. But we really have to think about developing technologies that will work long-term in, in single-family applications. Yeah, I used the opportunity to say too that NSF 350 really isn't intended for single family homes either. And so the systems that are, you know, if you look at the systems that are accredited, they're for larger flow rates, you know, and so maybe somewhere between 30 and 100 people. And so I think this, these, the challenges, you know, of, you know, these small scale treatment systems, you know, are, are, are real. And so um, this, and that's not just unique to this, this LR, this LRV approach. Thank you. Um, and chemical risk assessment. Um, there's the understanding that the dose response model averaging where models may be weighted by fit to dose response data or some other measure is a common practice. I haven't seen this applied in the QMRA. Has this approach been considered? Yeah, actually there have been, yeah, that has been used for a QMRA where we take the upper and lower bound and we do like a, a weighting where it's a, a, a random weighting of the two models and you get this kind of average model and we have used it in the past. Um, however, um, you know, for the pathogens that we're really concerned about, um, you know, norovirus, um, there's been recent data that's come out that's really shifted our understanding. And, you know, we're really learning, it's now showing that the upper bound dose response model for norovirus is more reflective of the data. And so um, that question about which dose response to use for norovirus has to a, a certain extent been resolved. And so um, really we have a, we're now using a single dose response for that. And so that's really the one that you see a big difference on. Um, and so um, there, that, that, yes, that approach has been tried, but I think now it's, it's not as important. Great, thank you. Um, the next uh, question and comment is about uh, residential swimming pools. Um, they're very common in terms of requiring backwashing for maintenance. Um, wondering if, what burden on water resources this may pose on a population level and how recycled water in this context could be useful for conserving water. Just curious if the idea has ever come up uh, in the water reuse world regarding um, what we're talking about. I haven't so seen that. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't looked at it either, you know, but it's, it's a, that's a cool idea. Um, but I think in this case, you know, what we would do is we would look at what is the, the exposure during, rec during recreational water use. And we actually have better estimates of, of exposure when you're, when you're using, when you're, when you're swimming in water than we do for these not, other non polar exposures. And so we could come up with those numbers, you know, you could look at, say, here's the different exposure that you have when you're swimming recreationally. Um, and it just has not been done to my, to my knowledge. Great. With the potential for inadequate operations and maintenance of such systems at the single family um, home level, has the risk of system failure been quantified? Yeah, I think this goes back a little bit to the other question about, about failures and quantifying failures. We, we didn't include failure assumptions in our in our log reduction target analysis, for example. But again, this is why we're suggesting continuous process monitoring so that, you know, if a process does fail, we can see that and that water is not delivered. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think for existing paradigms, like the, some of the NSF paradigms, there's a requirement to show that the system can reliably operate for some period of time without intervention by, by the operators say or the homeowner, whoever's, you know, owns the system. And so I, I think that's another approach is that, you know, you, you're ensuring some level of robustness or you're, you're definitely a aiming for that and maybe, you know, coupling that robust performance with, with monitoring. I think, yeah, we actually have, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a, this is an important distinction with the, the building skill in, you know, where, at building scale in San Francisco, for example, we know that there's operators that are looking, you know, maybe daily at the system to ensure that it's working. And so clearly that's a that's a nice feedback loop as we were talking about. And so, you know, just implementation has has unique considerations compared to, to building scale. And, and this is one of them. Yeah, exactly. Too. And, and at least in our models, you know, we, we include an indoor use. And so we don't really talk about the exposure piece here, but the indoor use, you know, for our gray water systems, it includes toilet flushing and clothes washing, but it also includes this uh, cross connection event. And so we, we model a, a, a rare event where um, a small fraction of the population will accidentally drink the water, you know, due to a cross connection or due to a misuse, say someone, you know, drinking from a toilet by, by accident, you know, whatever. 
um, if someone's child might do that, right? And so that's included in the model. And we've actually done some analysis to say, what conditions does that actually protect you against? It, it basically functions as a safety factor in the model. And it does protect against limited failure events. And so if your system is, is failing for a short period of time, because we already have that factor built in there, um, you do achieve some protection. Um, but again, that needs to be a, a short, a, that, that's only protected for a brief failure if your system is failing for a longer time. Again, back to the monitoring question, um, then certainly um, you are um, going to exceed your, your predicted risk. Thank you. We have a few more questions. We're doing a great job getting through all the questions, so thank you all. Um, next question is, what about systems where the influent is extremely high, uh, that, that treated water after successful log reduction could be unsafe for the public? I think we really tried to capture those high risk events in our modeling. And you can see, you know, when we look at those upper percentiles, those are, those are, you know, those are the rare events, you know, we are treating, you know, to protect 95% of the time. And so, you know, it really is these rare, that rare fifth percent time, the worst fifth percent of the days are the ones we're really treating for. And so, um, you know, we are trying to capture that in our models. You know, we do include conditions that, you know, are high risk, you know, things like washing diapers, you know, um, those would, you know, cause higher concentrations in your, in your, um, in your, in your, in your gray water, for example. And you know we include that data in our in our in our models to try to be make sure that we're protecting against those types of conditions, and that's part of the reason why you do see high treatment required um, for these onsite systems. Great, but yeah, and the next question was really if if for example you were assuming it's gray water, but it's actually black water. I think you uh, you addressed that, Michael, in terms of of your comment. Um, the uh, um, comment is and question is I find that. Uh, theoretical approach, very interesting. Have you conducted research into the economic and practical feasibility of the criteria that you've proposed for a family home of five people? Uh, you know, we, I showed earlier, we have looked at, at economic analysis in terms of life, life cycle costing of these decentralized systems. Uh, but the range that we've looked at had been from uh, buildings of various sizes, but not down to a household unit. That's something that I think um, remains to be done. But the data to date suggests that those small systems, you're going to pay an energy uh, cost and they're likely to be kind of uh, um, basically an increase in global warming potential or cumulative energy use than, than supplying centralized water to that uh, a small site. And Paula, I guess the panel that you're convening will also be focusing on topics similar to this. I think yes. other research that we're aware of, uh, there's a um, NAWI, uh, I, I should look up what the acronym means, the NAWI, I know that they're also looking at decentralized systems and and evaluating the, the economics and, and energy of this. So, so I think, I'll, I'll, there's several groups that are interested in this topic and are and, and are doing research into this. Great, thank you. There's questions about uh, small scale um, treatment systems. Um, five person, are they available in in the market, and how much do they cost? And the flow rate. If anyone has a comment on that, I think we we didn't. I think we built this really from the ground up, not an evaluation of existing systems with the treatment trains that we put together. I'm not sure Ava might have a different answer, but for, for Anya and for, for me, it was really, what was the, what do we think are reasonable treatment requirements? And then what, you know, what technologies would you need to do? What treatment train would you need in order to put this together? But, um, you know, we're, I think we're at sort of the, more towards the beginning of this re research topic or this this topic and and so so i don't think we have a lot of examples out there that are this treatment train that we could you know give a estimate for for cost there are some uh comments in in the q a uh, that there are existing five persons mbrs which are nsf 350 certified so just to point that out um for demonstrating LRTs for new technologies, there are pre-approved testing methods for manufacturers to follow, or would manufacturers need to develop their own methods? Alternative, alternatively, would external testing validation be required similar to NSF? 
I don't know if anyone has a comment on that. Yeah, it says for new technologies, are there pre-approved yeah. testing methods? I think that there are approaches for this that are stand that are standardized or you know that are a consistent framework for validating technologies. Um, the the water valve group in, in Australia put together something like a 10 or 11 step process for this that's systematic. And I know that the regulators in California are picking up that same sort of framework for, you know, validating technologies for municipal scale potable reuse. And so I think there's frameworks out there that people could follow. But I think that the, you know, the specifics of those, you know, the specific of the sort of surrogate testing or whatever testing you would do, you know, might need to be developed for, for the technology sort of in a technology specific way. Great. Thank you. Um, there is a comment asking, could the team disseminate completed parts of the LCA costing before the final report in 2024, uh, as it would help others in the methodology selection would be appreciated. So we will take that comment to our independent advisory panel, for sure. Thank you. Um, none of the examples in the webinar included black water combined uh, wastewater. Would that be covered in the guidelines? You know, I think uh, the the framework could easily be adopted to 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 deal with any water type, you know, including black water. And what will obviously change will be the concentration of pathogens would be would be higher, and the the log reduction targets would would go up. So I think it's totally possible to do that for black water. Um, Paula, I think what we haven't seen as many technologies out there at the single family scale that are Focusing on on black water, I think gray water has at least what we're seeing in the market right now is is, is the main focus. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible. Correct. And, um, and now we have the National Alliance for Water Innovation. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot that, and uh, Peter just uh, gave me the thing in the chat. So yes, great. Um, and then a comment uh, reflecting back to the very first slides that I presented, uh, is there a desired endpoint to set mandatory requirements for on-site water reuse in single family homes down the road, just like there has been on the larger buildings? Um, I We don't know at this point in time, uh, we uh, don't understand completely uh, the whole uh, realm in terms of feasibility for implementation. And I think that's why we in San Francisco have established this independent expert panel to help us understand the feasibility and implementation of single family water reuse applications. I think as you um, know that San Francisco is very interested in reducing the use of potable water for non-potable applications. And this is why we are embarking on this work. We just don't have all the answers uh, at this point, um, but we hope to uh, come June of next year. So thank you. Um, and I think our last uh, comment, it may be a question, but uh, certainly in addition to conflicting uh, uh, building codes, we have to overcome uh, uh, proliferation of permissive gray water uses based on BMPs with zero oversight and any type of monitoring that exists over several states beginning in 2000. There are unmeasured, um, but have not, these are unmeasured, but have not emerged as a concern to public health that we know of. How will LRTs be administered for current gray water acceptability? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think the if I understand the, the question is that there's a lot of gray water systems that were that are that are not currently being there's not oversight of these of these systems, just that people's home they may they set they may set them up. Um yeah, I guess I if that's the question, I I'm not sure what the answer is, like how they would get brought into the fold, um, you know, and yeah, I think oh, I think what the sure. question, yeah, yeah so I think what they may be getting at here is that you know there's been systems in place achieving these you know these endpoint targets you know and we haven't seen epidemiological evidence that there's that they're causing problems and causing public health issues in the communities um, and um, you know that's that while that that is probably true um, this is you know a, a 
it would be impossible. I shouldn't say impossible. It would be extremely challenging and intensive to try to detect these very small infection rates. The infection rates we're talking about, you know, that you might be, you know, to effect, to detect the infection rates in, in the first place in a population is challenging. And then to try to go down to, you know, to say, what is the differential effect that these systems themselves are having on those infection rates? You know, you would need to, you know, look at so many individuals over so much long of a time that it really would not be possible to detect these changes and those epi studies have not been done. And so we don't really know if those systems are leading to increase the disease. And we never really could know, um, you know, without, you know, a lot of in re intensive input. And so that's a that's a point that gets raised a lot is that these systems, you know, we don't see any evidence of them causing problems. So why are you trying to, you know, increase these these treatments? And, you know, this is why the field of QMRA exists in the first place is because the levels of infection we're talking about, one in 10,000 is minuscule. And so to be able to detect that effect um, would be extremely challenging. And so we have to rely on this risk modeling approaches instead to say, what might your risk be? Because we can't actually detect that. And so it's, a, it's an interesting um, nuance to the, the way this all works. Great. Well, I'd like to thank all of the participants for joining us today and the excellent questions and comments that we received. We appreciate that. And I'd also like to thank um, Michael and Jay and Brian and Anya and Eva and Eberhard. Appreciate all of your time and all of your work in terms of uh, the state of the science for single family water reuse applications. And as I mentioned, uh, this is not the end of our work for certainly from San Francisco's perspective. Uh, we look forward to engaging uh, our independent expert panel to address some of these questions that have both been brought up by participants as well as our panelists. So thank you all, uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to connecting with all of you soon. Thank you, bye-bye.